in Isaiah 53 verse 5 where it said but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed first Peter 2 verse 24 we're reminded that this is revealed in the person of Jesus where it says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed and so church this morning knowing that we respond by singing hallelujah thank you Jesus be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness. If it wasn't for the cross, you have won me with your. Chase me down where 
Romans 5 verse 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us.
Good morning on this Good Friday morning. Some of you are probably scratching your head about the door frame, the soldiers, and the cross. I mean, the cross probably makes sense to you if you're here on Good Friday. But you're probably wondering, like, is there a Bible verse somewhere that talks about soldiers running out of wood and tearing down door frames and creating a cross? So let me just give you some context. Over the last 10 weeks, we've been working our way through the book of Exodus on Sunday mornings. And Exodus is the account of how God rescues the people of Israel from slavery and begins the fulfillment of this promise that he made to their ancestor many, many years before that he would give them a land of their own. And so last week in our series, we reached a pivotal moment as we came to Exodus 11 and 12. In fact, this moment is so pivotal that to this day, Jews mark it with the ceremony, and that ceremony is called Passover. This is, this is the moment when God brings down a judgment upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians for the slavery and oppression they had placed on the people of Israel that is so severe that Pharaoh finally relents and lets the people go. And the judgment was this. That on a single night in the land of Egypt, in every household, in every part of the country, the firstborn would die. Every household except for the households where the blood of a lamb had been put on the doorframe, a lamb had been slain to cover the people who were in that house and to cause the judgment of the Lord to pass over. We see this in Exodus chapter 12, verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. And so that's why the door frame was up, because that's what we looked at last week. But, but this wasn't just about marking a house so that God knew who was inside the house. If that was the case, they could have just put some red paint on there. They could have just hung up a sign that said, uh, Israelite house, please move along. But that was not what was the case because blood was necessary. And blood was necessary because it marked that a substitute had been provided. And as I said on Sunday... Death came to every house in Egypt that night. The only question was who was going to die. Now part of my struggle, and I, I shared this on Sunday, I, I struggle with the Passover story. I, I, I get really torn in it. Part of the struggle is I really don't, like I'm uncomfortable with death of any kind. To the point where for the longest time, if we had a mouse get in the mouse trap in our house, I'd tap Amanda on the shoulder and see if she could go grab that and drop it in the garbage. I, I just don't like dealing with dead stuff. But, but my bigger struggle is actually this, and maybe this is your struggle too. Uh, that just doesn't seem like a fair exchange. Like, we kind of know at our core that, that the life of a lamb and the life of a child is not the same thing. That's why if I came to you and said, hey, I've got a lamb, I'd like to swap it for your child or for your grandchild, you'd likely turn me down. Likely. <laughs> Here's what I want you to see this morning. 1,400 years later, while the people of Israel are once again celebrating and remembering this rescue of God, the temporary reprieve from death for all who had had their freedom purchased by the blood of a lamb. God was in the process of providing a better Passover lamb. He was in the process of providing a lamb who could rescue all once and for all. That on Good Friday, Jesus died on a cross as our better Passover lamb. So, so I want to spend a little bit of time this morning just 
explaining to you, sharing with you, looking at God's word to say, what makes Jesus a better Passover lamb? The first thing I want you to see is that Jesus is a better Passover lamb because Jesus alone is without blemish. See, in the Passover instructions, God told Moses in Exodus 12, 5, that the lamb must be without blemish. God's holy requirement is perfection because he is a holy and perfect God. This is not a, an Old Testament thing. This is a Jesus thing. In, in Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we see at the very beginning of creation, if you flip back in your Bible, you look at Genesis chapter 2, God warns us that the choice to rebel, to disobey him, to go our own way would be death. Then the Apostle Paul, he restates this principle in the New Testament. So in Romans, Romans 6.23, he says, the wages of sin is death. Now, if you're a sinner... This is a problem. And we got a problem because we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, or that is, of God's glorious standard of perfection. And I think, and I always say this, I don't have to do, I, I don't think, a lot of convincing to you to show you this. Because whenever you just think about your life and the times that you have failed to meet your own standard, the times you have let yourself down, you haven't lived up to your own expectation, man, if we can't live up to our own expectations, how are we ever going to live up to God's expectations? Now, some of you are saying, well, this is a struggle because you're right, nobody's perfect. And I would agree with you. Nobody's perfect, except one. That one was Jesus. See, when, when Jesus went to the cross, when Jesus died, it was actually the only time in human history where a truly innocent man died. It, it, it's the only time that death was truly unjust because it's the only time that an innocent man died. Because Jesus was sinless. He was the spotless lamb. But that means that because he was sinless, because he was without blemish, his death was sufficient for us. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter 18 and 19. He says that we were ransomed or that we were rescued. We were purchased from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like gold or silver. That is, you can't buy it with money. There's nothing you can purchase it with. So how were we ransomed and rescued? With the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. It was the perfection of Christ that made his sacrifice acceptable because only a perfect savior could act as a perfect substitute for you and I. It was the only payment that would suffice. My experience has been that a lot of people seem to believe that God kind of is like the professor that grades on the curve. You ever have a professor or teacher that grades on the curve? They're kind of looking at how everybody else performs in the class, and if you're kind of in the top 10% of how the class performs, then you get an A, and if you're in the top 25%, maybe you get a B, and if you're kind of middle of the road, you get a C. That's not how God operates. With God, there is no curve. It's not that you just need to be in the top 5% of good people, or 10%, or 25%, or even in the upper half. We need to be without sin because the wages of sin is death. And only Jesus could pay what was owed. See, Jesus died on Good Friday because our good isn't good enough. We can't earn our salvation. We needed somebody to purchase it for us. When Jesus died on the cross as the lamb without blemish, he purchased salvation for us that we could never purchase through our own efforts. 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Apostle Paul said, God made him 
who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, on Good Friday, on the cross, there is a a great reversal that takes place that Jesus, in acting as our ultimate and perfect substitute, he takes our sin and in exchange we receive his righteousness if we place our faith and trust in him. Not only is he the better Passover lamb because of his blamelessness and his spotlessness, but Jesus is the better Passover lamb because his blood is sufficient to cover every sin. See, when the Israelites killed the lamb on the night of the Passover, that blood was placed on a doorframe. And the blood was sufficient for one night for one house. And that was it. That was it. And in the 1,400 years that transpired between that first Passover night and when Christ would go to the cross, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lambs would continue to be sacrificed for the sake of sins. And they were never sufficient. But when Jesus arrives, listen to the words of John the Baptist in John chapter 129. He says, behold the Lamb of God, as he looks at Jesus, who takes away the sin of the entire world. The the blood of the Passover lamb was sufficient for a night, but the blood of Jesus is sufficient for all time. When Jesus went to the cross on Good Friday, he did it to cover every sin, every sin that ever was committed, every sin that ever would be committed. Do you want to know what's so good about Good Friday? It's that when Jesus died on the cross, it was the final death that was necessary for substitution. Hebrews 7, 27 says this, Unlike those other high priests, he, that is Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. What's so good about Good Friday is that there is no sin that you have ever committed There is no sin that you will ever commit that the blood of Jesus is not sufficient for. Listen, and it's not just that we don't earn our salvation like I've already said, it's that we don't add to it. Like when Jesus dies on the cross and he says, it is finished, it was finished. There's nothing that you or I can bring to to add to our salvation. It also means that there's no individual who is beyond the scope of the sacrifice that Jesus made. Like, I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you're going to do. But here's what I know. Jesus' blood was sufficient to cover it. The Passover lamb was sufficient for a single home on a single night. But the sacrifice and substitution of Jesus is sufficient for all time for everyone. Jesus is also the best and the better Passover lamb because his death defeated death. You know what happened to every person whose life was saved by the death of a lamb on that first Passover? They died. They didn't die that night, but they still died. The sacrifice of that lamb was only applicable, only sufficient for a single night. But the death Jesus died defeated death itself. He he came so that you and I could have life who deserve death. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish, doesn't have to die, but will receive eternal life. See, Good Friday is the proof 
of God's love for you and I. I know in a group this size, there are some of you who t- today who are doubting God's love for you. I-, I know that some of you, in the past while in your life, you've received a diagnosis. You've suffered a loss. You've got a situation that is going on in your family. You have a harm that has been done to you in the past or maybe is being done to you right now. There's been an injustice that has taken place with someone that you care about and love deeply. I know that this is a world in which Death seems to reign, but God's promise is life. And when our hearts cry out, and they will cry, man, if your heart doesn't cry out now, if it hasn't cried out in the last year, there is coming a time where your heart will cry out, where is God? That's where God was. He was dying on the cross to put death to death. He he was dying on the cross, taking upon himself the sin and the brokenness and the heartache and the injustice and the hurt that we feel and that we experience. And he's doing it for you and I out of love so that he can begin to take us towards a place where none of those things exist anymore. He's doing it to give us Life, life now with him, and I'm telling you, life with God through Christ is so good. There are so many blessings in the now that God begins to give us. But it's not just life now. It's not just life for a time. It's not just life for a night like the original Passover lamb purchase. It is life forever with him. It is life in a new heaven and a new earth where there is no sickness, where there is no injustice, where there is no harm, where there is no hurt, where there is no death. And no lamb could purchase that. Only the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, could purchase that for us. Jesus is the better Passover lamb Because he's spotless, Jesus is the better Passover lamb because he is sufficient once and for all time to cover sin. Jesus is the better Passover lamb because his death defeats death, but Jesus is also the better Passover lamb because his blood purchased better freedom. See, the blood of the lamb was what caused the people to be set free. They were alive to receive freedom and those who had not put the blood on They had had a death happen in their family, even Pharaoh, and Pharaoh had set them free because of the judgment of God. But this is a better freedom that Jesus offers. I think a lot of times we mistake sin for freedom. We 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 interpret freedom in our day, in our age, is me being free to do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whoever I want. Right? That's to us, that's the definition of freedom we've received. But The Bible makes clear that if we aren't walking in the way of God, we are actually walking in the way of slavery. That sin is slavery. John 8, 34, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And whether you've ever thought about this before, some of you have experienced it, you know it's true. Like, think about that time that you lied because you thought in lying you would be free from the consequences of something else you did, and now you live in slavery to that lie, trying to cover it up, trying to move it aside, trying to make sure nobody knows so that it doesn't get discovered and you don't get found out, and that lie that promised you freedom has made made you its slave. Some of you have turned to alcohol, Because it promised to free you. Promised to free you from pain. It promised to free you from social awkwardness. It promised to free you from boredom. Maybe it promised to free you from remembering. 
And yet, instead of setting you free, it now has you as its slave. Some of you can relate to this through the lens of unforgiveness. This promise that you could hold on to this thing. And that by holding on to it, you could somehow exact justice upon the person who had harmed or hurt you. And yet the tighter you have clung to that, the tighter it has clung to you. And it has dug down deep and created deep roots of bitterness that have paralyzed you and made you its slave. See, sin enslaves us, but when Christ came as our better over Passover lamb, he came to set us free. Romans 6, 6 says, we know that our old self, it was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Church, I just want to let you know, Jesus died to set you free. You don't have to live in slavery and bondage anymore. He, he, he came to set you free from the power of sin in your life. He came to set you free from the stain of shame on your life. That got nailed to the cross. Your sin, if you placed your faith in Christ, got nailed to the cross. You don't have to live in sin and shame anymore. And he came to set us free from the consequences of sin in our life, which is death. If you are in Christ, sin is no longer your master. Christ is your master. And in Christ, there is true freedom. See, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus is our better Passover lamb. He, he was sacrificed as our substitute. He, he, he died the death that we all deserve to die because of our rebellion. And instead, Christ died in our place. His death purchased for us what we could never earn. His death covers all sin for all time so we don't get saved and then work for our salvation moving forward. No, we keep on coming back to the cross and putting the blood of Christ over our sin to set us free and wash us clean. His death defeated death and rescued us from slavery to sin. Without Without the blood of Jesus daubed over us in the same way that that blood of the lamb was daubed over the households on that Passover day, we have no hope. Without his death, there is no life. But when we receive Jesus as our better Passover lamb, when we receive him as our substitute, the one who died to set us free from sin and death, there is no judgment upon you and I. The judgment of God passes over us because of the judgment placed on Christ. And as we come to a close here, I think it's so great that we're going to end with communion. Because just as Israel was commanded to remember God's salvation through the Passover, we are commanded to remember Christ's death until he comes again. We're called to remember a greater salvation that was purchased by a greater lamb. See, communion is really the fulfillment of the Passover meal. Just as the redemption of Jesus as the Passover lamb is the fulfillment of the Exodus, so the Lord's Supper is the fulfillment of the feasts of the Passover and the feasts of unleavened bread. J just as I talked about on Sunday, that the Passover, it shaped the identity of God's people, that a people were now called a community and a congregation because of the rescue and salvation of God. So the Lord's Supper, it shapes our identity. Right? This is who we, the bread and the blood is now not just something we do, it's who we are. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, and maybe today for the very first time, you said, hey, I want to trust in the blood of Jesus to cover over my sin and my shame. I'm done living in slavery. 
I, I, I realize I can't earn my salvation, but I recognize Jesus died as my substitute. It, it, even if you did that this day, if you've trusted in the sacrifice that Jesus made on your behalf on the cross for your sins, then I want to invite you as we remember our greater Passover lamb and the great salvation that we have received through his sacrifice. I want to invite you to participate as we confess that that this is our story. This is our song. This is our greater identity. We are in Christ and we have been set free. So let me pray for the elements then we're going to partake of them together. Father, as we prepare ourselves to take the bread and the cup, we confess that we're not worthy. There is nothing in us which allows us to stand before a holy God. But there was everything in Christ and he made the way as our greater, better Passover lamb. Thank you for sending Christ to suffer and die for us on that Good Friday, to pay the penalty for sin that we could never pay, pay back a debt that we owed that we just did not have the resources to ever begin to repay. As we take the bread, I pray that we would be reminded afresh and anew of Christ's body broken for us, that he died our death in our place so that we could receive his righteousness. As we take the cup, that we would be reminded that there is through Christ a forgiveness for all of our sins. There is no sin too great or too small. There's no sin too far in the past. His blood covers over all sin for all time. It doesn't matter who we are. If we turn to him and ask for his forgiveness and repent, his blood, his forgiveness is sufficient for us to cleanse us and to redeem us. So God, as we eat these things, these are a confession of the truths that we believe. It's not just a symbol of, uh, it's not just a, a, a rote action, that, an activity that we go through. This is our earnest confession this day that we need Jesus and that we are thankful for him. Thank you. And we come to him, we come to you through his name. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. So let's peel back the first layer take the wafer and as I said as I prayed when we take this wafer this is Christ's body broken for us I want you to think back to last week they killed the Passover lamb and they had to consume that lamb and as Jesus sat in the upper room he took that bread he passed it around and he said this is my body I am a greater lamb take this it's my body broken for you. Let's take and eat in remembrance of him. And in the same way, since he was up there in that upper room celebrating the Passover with his disciples and he, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. As the Passover lamb's blood was put on the door frame so the judgment of God would pass over. So we take this cup and proclaim that in Christ, the judgment of God passes over us. Our sin has no power over us because Christ took the penalty for us. Let's take and drink. And now let's worship the lamb together. Let's stand together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the
It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. <laughs> 